My name is Roger Erlin. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at my 54 Speak custom four-door Imperial. Mm -hmm. um, production number is about 4,500. It was a low production year for Chrysler. It was the last year of the first, first post-war restyling before they went to the fancy forward look. And uh, she's kind of an elegant old grandpa car. This car is equipped with air conditioning. It's the second year that Chrysler offered air conditioning after World War II. And I think there might be 10% of Imperial production, which means a total of about between four and 500 cars that were built with the factory air conditioning. See, the longest wheelbase, six passenger car built in America since World War II at 133 and a half inch wheelbase. 331 cubic inch Hemi, also the first year they went to a four barrel carburetor and dual exhaust. <laughs> She has eight beautiful gold ruby crowns, mm. four on the car, four on the wheels. Mm. It's been a complete restoration. She was, uh, the car was complete and pretty much running by the way, right in a very tired condition. Mm -hmm. It's had all of the cosmetics redone and a fair amount of mechanical attention as well. I see the ducts for the factory air conditioning in there. And what can you tell, you tell me about the air conditioning unit? The air conditioning unit is really basically an adaptation of, a, of an industrial or commercial air unit, which would have been used in a walk-in refrigerator, a building air, air conditioning system, freezers. Um, it uses a, it's a huge compressor, cast iron compressor that uses uh, R22, not R12. Uh, it does not use a uh, compressor clutch. The fan belts are normally hooked up whenever you want to run the air conditioning and it's running continuously until you unhook the belts. So, what more can we say about the engine? The car also has a two-stage oh. uh, condenser. There's a pre-condenser coil that runs in front of the radiator and then down in the splash pan below is the main condenser. So it uh, doesn't restrict the airflow to the engine. It's again it's a three thirty one cubic inch Hemi with a four barrel. No hammer. Dual exhaust. Two hundred and thirty five horsepower from the factory. Mm-hmm. Pardon me? Let me get this side here. Boy, that is a huge <laughs> reservoir. That's your power steering reservoir? Yes, this is the power steering. It's, uh, the pump is driven off the back of the generator. Huh. Now, does this have, where's the, uh, no, there's no power brake booster, is there? There is a power brake booster. It's located under the driver's seat in a very convenient location. Now, that's the battery? That's the battery. That is a gel battery. It's an Optima battery. It gives 850 cold cranking amps. Wow. Which is, uh, y you can use that in a 6-volt ignition system. So it is a 6-volt then? No, you said 8? No, it is 6-volt. Wow. I've never seen that. Where do you get those? Uh, I got them through a friend who was working for a Jaguar dealer at the time, but uh, they were distributed by Interstate Batteries, who I believe is coming out with their own gel battery. But uh, a battery distributor would have it. Mm. Look at that. Wow. That is such a fine design. And I'm sure you have all the ads for it, right? Yes. Yes. This diving eagle is a very dramatic hood ornament. And it's very interesting to compare, Could you compare this car, and unfortunately we don't have one here um, to compare it to, but the earlier, the 5123 Imperials, which had a very stodgy look to them, a very vertical front end to them. And Virgil Exner tinkered with this one. He couldn't do a complete body design change because that was waiting for 1955. But by adding this little piece to the hood, leading edge of the hood, which points downward by bringing this grill bar further out, by bringing this um, castellated grill bar even further out, smoothing out the bumper so that it slopes down, the, the, it goes from a very flat front to more of a uh, wedge uh, yes. prow look to it, a more modern look to it. And the I same see. is done subtly at the rear. Just by tinkering with some of the little details, the applique that was put on the car, as opposed to doing major body changes. Sure, we can chip. Okay, so you've restored these hubcaps? Yes, I polished them myself. I, I had the uh, crowns replated, and then I was able to refurbish the silvering behind the 
uh, plastic ruby crowns, in the ruby in the crowns. Uh. These cars look wonderful with the wire, the Kelsey Hayes wire wheels, which were available. Uh, the ad that I have shows the car with the Kelsey Hayes wire wheels, but the thing that I miss is those gold crowns. Oh, boy, aren't they beautiful. They're just a pretty little accent, especially in a black car. They really are. Well, that's an incredible car. I, I noticed that it has, seems to have more chrome on it, more stainless and uh, chrome on it than the 53s. Uh, oh, absolutely. Um, it's, again, to emphasize length rather than height, this speed streak down the side, and then the uh, the speed streak on the rear fender that melds into the tail light. Mm -hmm. And I notice there's an awful lot of it around the windows. Oh yes, the uh, 53 does not have this piece above the doors, it mm -hmm. has the sill molding. This car also is unusual because it has the factory rear view mirrors, outside rear view mirrors, which mm -hmm. I don't have the heads for it yet. Right. Uh, but they are integrated into the trim on the door as opposed to being added on. Right. And they, they adjust with a ratchet to a different uh, adjustments. Um, very, very few cars, if you look at ads or even contemporary photographs of cars in the 50s, very, very few of them are ever shown with mirrors. Yeah. Cars were uh, about the last of the Chrysler cars that were built by the Briggs Body Company, which was always known for doing very high quality bodies, very good strong structural engineering, very good fit and finish. Mm -hmm. They also built the Packard bodies. Chrysler bought Briggs in about 51 or 52, then by, uh, and that's part of what got Chrysler into trouble in 57 when they designed and built their own bodies and they were not anywhere near to the standard quality of the brakes for spotty work. And they were also doing too much at once, too many, trying to bring too much in, in line at once, and being too radical, and uh, they suffered badly for poor build quality, uh, poor corrosion resistance. Uh, these cars are built like bank vaults, very, very strong. Quiet, trouble-free. As the promotional film that I have says, this is America's first family of fine cars. And I really do believe that. This was also the end of the, er of the era of when Chrysler <laughs> built stodgy cars. They were not the most stylish cars. They really compared very, very poorly to the uh, newly designed GM cars of 54, which were very flashy, very stylish. And uh, unfortunately, Chrysler found out by then that engineering alone did not sell these cars. They had to have some pizzazz to sell. They had to, uh, they had to have styling mm -hmm. uh, to make it all work. Well, that's a door. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. Uh, comparing the 53 to the 54, in 1953, these cars carried uh, a script on the hood and on the rear of the car that said Imperial. One would think that that was beginning to establish Imperial as a separate mark as they did in 1955. Mm -hmm. But for some reason in 1954, they went back to badging these cars as Chrysler. So where does it say Imperial? On? On this car. Oh, right in the center. Oh, of course, yes. A large script. Yes. On the front, front fenders. Love that script. I want to. I want to do it in the on the computer as artwork. Mm -hmm. And that that's. It's the same script used in '55 and '56. It's an interchangeable piece, actually. Huh. 